Hey, Hickok45 here. Or is it Babyface Nelson? Or maybe Machine Gun Kelly? Not sure. <laughs> One or the other. Either way, we have a Thompson submachine gun. Especially today, we appreciate Royal Range in Bellevue, Tennessee for bringing out a couple of Thompson submachine guns. Unbelievable. I fired them before, but I've never had the pleasure of firing one here at the compound. Fully auto. And if you don't believe it, if you weren't watching, let me do it again. That was full auto. Let's put a hole in the bottom of that thing. How's that? Yeah, we appreciate Royal Range coming out today with these things. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Doesn't take long to empty a 25 or 30 round magazine. Oh, man, this is something else. Let me uh, bring it over here and let you take a look at it here. A couple of uh, empty magazines there. We have a couple of these things. And the barrel got hot for some reason there. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about them and how they've uh, evolved. I don't know everything there is to know about the Thompson submachine gun, but I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> well, I don't want to be dangerous with them, but uh, you know what I mean. Uh, this one's kind of a, a, a 1921 configuration. They've done some stamping on it to make it more authentic looking and everything. And this is more of the uh, 1928A1 model, okay, with some of the changes that uh, were made at that point. And then as we got into World War II, there were even further changes to make them simpler to uh, manufacture and cheaper and faster, you know, to manufacture uh, during the war, which typically happens. And I don't know about you, but I was really always under the impression up until recently that the ones used in World War II, those were the ultimate Thompson. Those were the coolest. Now they might be, you know, to you or, or me, but it, actually the originals, uh, and this is more like the original, you know, the 1921 version, uh, they were really uh, works of art and they were expensive to make. They had this the friction uh, delayed recoil system using a little bronze piece in there and all this kind of thing. I mean, uh, John Thompson figured all that out, uh, how to make them reliable and to work. Uh, you know, the fins on the barrel, uh, just and beautifully finished, you know, bluing and everything. So actually the ones that were used in World War II were, were simplified and they made modifications. They put the bolt over on the side instead of the top and some other things I'll, I'll remind you of later. They put a simpler, cheaper side, rear side on them and all that. So actually the ones you see in the, I guess in most of the movies or the World War II models are a lesser gun in a lot of ways. So, so these actually the older ones are, are the cooler ones really. The ones from the gangster era of the Roaring Twenties, okay? And that's what comes to mind when you see this, isn't it? You see that vertical grip? I mean, it is, does for me. Uh, you know, the fins on the barrel, which help cool, cool it. Uh, the compensator on the end, the top bolt handle, all that. I mean, this, this, this is the Roaring Twenties. The gangster, John Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, it, it was, uh, <laughs> it's what we see in the movies and it's what was used a, a great deal uh, back in the day of the, the motorized bandits as they called them, you know, because they could run around the country. It's kind of like the Wild West in a way because, you know, Bonnie and Clyde and all those motorized bandits, they could run around and rob a bank and have, uh, you know, incredible firepower like this, jump in their car and have a fast car and they could get away. There were no radios to call ahead and head them off and all that sort of thing. So it was just like coming out of the bank, getting on your horse and taking off, you know, in 1880. So that's the reason uh, for that. If you've seen a lot of those movies, you've read about that era at all, uh, it seems uh, kind of weird, you know, how'd they get by with that and how'd they do that? Just right into town and shoot up the town and they, they would shoot people, shoot the police and they would just take off. You know, with enough firepower, they mainly just had to overcome whatever resistance they had from citizens or the police. And if they got out of town, they might've been clear, you know? So it was just a different time, you know, uh, technology took care of a lot of that, but it was a very interesting time period. Uh, so anyway, this is kind of like the first versions. Now they, both of these actually, before I get too far afield here, uh, these two were imported back from Russia early on in the, I guess, I don't know, 1930s, uh, got up close to World War II. Uh, 
we either sold or we, we leased some of these to Russia and they ended up not using them much because they didn't have ammo for them really. But uh, so these came back from Russia and uh, they, you know, it's in parts kits. And so the, the pieces of them mostly are authentic. There's a few reproduction pieces here and there, but you know, these came back from Russia. So, and of course they're perfectly legal paperwork and all that, or they wouldn't be here at, at the compound. So we're happy to be able to bring them to you. We've we got some other things on the table here, just uh, again, the ambiance of the period. Uh, ridge, well, this is the reproduction, uh, 1918, you know, Colt. And then this is World War II. We've got the 1917 45 ACP revolver there, an old 38. You know, some of the guns that would have been carried at the time, and of course the Garand uh, you've seen recently here, the compound, and uh, 1897 uh, shotgun which you'll be seeing soon in a video, hopefully. Uh, you know, these are some of the firearms that were popular in that era. And I think if you're anything like us, John and, and me, uh, well, first of all, I feel sorry for you if you're too much like me, but, but we just love these old firearms, you know, from this, this time period. You know, they're all wooden steel, you know. Uh, I like my polymer firearms, but these are cool. So anyway, uh, not to give you all the history, you can read and find out whatever you want to know, but uh, John Thompson was back in the 1915, 16, 17, whatever. He fought, or he was in the Spanish-American War in 1898 and, uh, and observed, he was a munitions expert, as I understand, and he was interested in maybe, he thought there was a need for a, a, a carryable machine gun. He saw how effective a machine gun was down there in Cuba. Uh, of course, they were all big and ungainly and Gatling guns and, you know, uh, mounted on tripods and everything, but they were so effective. So he kind of set about trying to create a machine gun, an automatic rifle. And I don't know if you knew this or not. I didn't know it until recently. I started reading some more on these. He was really interested initially in creating uh, an automatic or semi-automatic rifle, you know, to fire a powerful round, you know, like the 30 6 And uh, and he actually had it, it going. And with the recoil, the delayed recoil system he had, the friction uh, delayed mm -hmm. recoil system he was using, it, it wouldn't work with a powerful cartridge. And so it was like, uh-oh, back to the drawing board. Then they got the idea of using a uh, pistol cartridge. And voila, mm -hmm. the 45 ACP. And that solved the problem. And then the, so it went from there. And the rest is history. Mm -hmm. And so he created this interesting firearm. Mm -hmm. The early ones took a drum magazine. You see the cut out. We don't have a drum mag. They're, they're kind of unreliable and ungainly and everything. They're, they're cool, but it slips in from the side. The top of it does. And uh, it will take a drum magazine. Again, in World War II, around 42, 43, mm -hmm. the, I guess the M1, A1, I don't know, but the, the modification that they, uh, where they modified these things. And then the one that was used, I think, the most extensively uh, that they manufactured the most of during World War II wouldn't even take a drum magazine. They discovered that they were heavy, they rattled, made a lot of noise, took a long time to load them, and they just weren't very practical. And so they went to the stick magazine. So it is cool to have 50 or 100 rounds in the thing, but it's already mm -hmm. very heavy, okay? You notice when I shoot it now, you want me to shoot it some more? I do. Uh, it, it doesn't jump very much, right? Because it's heavy. It's a heavy rascal and it absorbs that recoil just beautifully okay let's shoot it again here what do we have you know what i've got a big pot down there the biggest pot that we have ever tried to smoke i'm gonna go down here and try to smoke that thing it's massive it must weigh 50 pounds all right let's see if these will bounce off of it or what they'll do to it <laughs> oh, nice. Two liter. Oh. Had a bad round. There we go, or light, light strike. Okay. We haven't had too many of those. We've had a couple today. We've been shooting this thing today and having fun. It's empty. But, uh, let me know it's not. i got another magazine. Let's shoot something else. You think I hit a two liter with a full auto? It's a little awkward to load. Uh, it's hard to do a speed load. I could get better at it if I uh, shot it every day. I'd do better if I used two hands to slap it right up in there. All right, watch me in full auto mode. Pop that old two liter. Yeah, how about that one? 
<laughs> uh, you think I hit the gong with it? I'm going to put the rest of this magazine on the gong or at the gong. Okay. I'm not sure where to hold actually. <laughs> I think I got it a couple of times. Oh man. So if you notice, it just doesn't rise much when you shoot it. So that's one of the cool things about it. If you can lift it, you can control it. Okay. It's very controllable. Uh, it's just heavy, just heavy. So before I get it too hot, maybe I ought to show you the simplicity of it. It. Uh, I'm not going to take it totally down here, but uh, push this button, stock slides off, and of course you can shoot it like that. We'll probably do that. You think? And then uh, you depress this little uh, button right here. I don't think I think I have a uh, knife. You can, if you got a big long fingernail, that'll work too. But I think I've got my knife here. Yeah, there we go. Use the tip of it. And I can slide the trigger assembly out of there. Firing mechanism. Let's see, first of all, to make sure the bolt's down. Yeah. Okay. These are interesting pieces of hardware, no doubt about it. Slide that back. Pull the trigger, and it comes the rest of the way off. So pretty simple cleaning. Now the bolt's a little more involved. You get the spring started, pull the spring up out of there and the bolt comes out. Okay, big old, big old bolt. Interesting firearm. Uh, again, this was designed back in 19, uh, like I think they started in 1916 working on it. And then uh, in uh, 1921 is when they first started really producing, you know, many of them. I think Colt uh, was the biggest producer early on, about 15,000 of them. Savage and then Auto Ordnance, of course. John uh, Thompson started uh, the company, Auto Ordnance, and uh, manufactured the things, thinking this would be a perfect weapon in World War I and all the trench warfare, because you know the machine guns just kept people down in the trenches, and this is something that you could have advanced with and uh, maybe uh, had some luck with that, uh, more so than a bolt action rifle. But uh, the first prototypes, as I understand, were, were ready to go, ready to ship to Europe, and uh, World War I ended. You know, so that was uh, in what, November of 1918, I think. So didn't quite make it to World War I. And so this wonderful device didn't have any place to go fight, essentially, and become famous you know, until World War II. And John Thompson was busy trying to sell it other places, like to police departments and everything. And, and some of them bought it, but it, it, he never had a great sales success with it because it was expensive, it was a couple hundred dollars. And you could buy a Ford automobile at the time for $400. So 200 bucks was a lot of money for a firearm. Plus it was probably kind of scary to police departments, uh, you know, and very expensive. So until the gangsters got a hold of it and, and started using it, you didn't see as many police departments you know, using it. Then they needed to fight fire with fire, and I think he started selling a few more of them. You know. But it really wasn't until uh, World War II when uh, they realized, the military realized, or got close to World War II, hey, you know what? I might have some use for that because subguns were showing up more and more frequently by that time. And I think he sold the first batches to like the Navy and the Marines. Uh, and then some overseas and around. And uh, then, as I said, the military made some modifications to it because uh, they needed it to be easier to build and cheaper and faster. And so they made uh, some modifications uh, that were needed to be made, okay? But anyway, we still think of this in the, the gangland wars uh, for good reason. It was used extensively and uh, just a devastating uh, a weapon when you get right down to it because you can dump out if you've got a drum magazine in that thing imagine you see how fast and that it the rate is about uh, on these is about 800 750 800 uh, rounds per minute so it's perfect it's the perfect rate of fire and that's what the military wanted too a slower rate of fire the original ones had like a 1200 mm -hmm. rounds per minute rate of fire or something but this is a much better rate of fire very sweet to shoot uh, it really is let's put another magazine in it and you know what we need to shoot is the paper target here <laughs> I don't think anything will explode but let's put a couple on each one of those two liters 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Let's try a couple of real two liters. Oh, thank you for the show there. Nice. There's one. Oh. <laughs> Another pot. <laughs> oh, cool. What else? Oh, a pan. Someone put a skillet over there. <laughs> I think I'm empty again. I could shoot this all day. I tell you, uh, this is something else. As I have said before, we don't really deserve all the help we get, you know. Uh, Buds, uh, Federal, uh, Royal Range, nature, nice sunny day, no rain today for a change. Let me put another magazine in my pocket in case I uh, get caught over here in an ambush or something. All right. All right. Let's uh, let's go over there and just take a couple shots across the hill, and uh, I'm gonna put a couple more right there at the gong first. Ah, right, cool. <laughs> I'm gonna try the top row of animals. <laughs> okay, we had a malfunction. That's not a very common thing, but. We've been shooting it all day. We'll give him a break. All right. Let's try some uh, rams. Hey, got a couple of them. <laughs> that is something. I think I have another ram. No, I don't. Okay. Thompson submachine gun. Amazing. I had one of these in the semi-automatic configuration, you know, made by auto ordnance. The same company that made them originally. That company, as I understand, has gone through some different gyrations over the years, but that is the same company, Auto Ordnance, that uh, John Thompson you know, started. He had some investors, but uh, they started that company. And uh, I think they sold out all their assets at one point, but it's still you know, the, the same company. And they're still making these things in uh, semi-automatic you know, configuration. These are very expensive. Uh, they run anywhere from twenty to thirty-five thousand dollars. Okay, partly because you know the the, the huge man, but they're 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 illegal unless you go through the paperwork and all that. And what made it so popular in the twenties? Well, gangsters. Prohibition uh, was the real catalyst in nineteen nineteen when uh, alcohol be alcoholic beverages were outlawed. And then of course that started all the gang warfare because there was a lot of money to be made because it was illegal. And uh, so these things kind of ruled the day there for a while. I guess one of the most famous uh, incidents of the day is the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929 when uh, Al Capone, some of his henchmen, uh, attacked some members of a rival gang, the Bugsy Moran or somebody's gang, and uh, assassinated five or six of them in a garage, just mowed them down. And there's been movies based on that. Uh, but you know, they, they just, uh, they're, they're great for Hollywood, of course, and they uh, were actually used in that context, you know, robbing banks, uh, because who's going to get in the way if you're a citizen or even the police departments until they became really well armed themselves? What are you going to do if uh, a couple of carloads of thugs come into your little town and they've got four or five Thompsons and shotguns and, uh, and all kinds of handguns and, and they are ready to die? on that day they're going to rob that bank and they're going to shoot their way out of there they're not giving up uh you know tough to deal with right uh but as but as police departments developed uh better systems and and got equal firepower radios then uh that that kind of put an end to that kind of activity for one thing they plus they, they finally caught a lot of the, the really bad guys that were they were doing that the ones that you know, were so famous babyface nelson and Dillinger and all those those characters and it was hard to get by with that in the late late 30s so and believe it or not you could order one of these things in the 20s and I guess the 30s up until 1934 you could uh, till you know National Firearms Act uh, was enacted you could order one of these through the mail you know I, I could if, if I could go back in a time machine right here living here in 1928 or 1932 what if I could afford it and they were well they were a couple hundred bucks but I could just order one I think from Sears and Roebuck or whoever they threw them whatever you could just order it by the mail 
or you could go into a gun shop and just buy one. And, uh, and people did, okay? So pretty interesting time period. Uh, and, and these things are out there. There are a lot of people that own these sorts of firearms. If you're new to shooting videos or to our channel or whatever, and you haven't seen some of the things we've, we've demonstrated or talked about, all this is perfectly legal except they're expensive and you got to go through a lot of background checks and uh, waiting period paperwork and everything but almost no crimes are committed with registered mm -hmm. machine guns and there mm -hmm. are thousands tens of thousands of them in private individuals mm -hmm. hands just this is a reminder just like uh, suppressors mm -hmm. and they're rarely ever ever abused uh, uh crimes committed with them rarely ever so almost never so i've got more ammo or do i yeah i do Okay, we're shooting 230 grain hardball, uh, federal, and uh, maybe I'll shoot this other one. Let's say I haven't shot it. Now, it's, it's been a little more finicky, but it's worked pretty well. Now, this one, again, it has uh, the, the horizontal uh, forend, like it was used in the, in the military. And uh, it still has the, now this is, again, 1928-81, I think. And early in the war, this is more like what they had been using or maybe manufacturing, although... They, anything that auto ordnance had, you know, the military bought. Uh, but uh, that was one of the mod modifications there. And like I said, a cheaper sight. You can see the rear sight. This one has a flip up sight on the rear, and you got that simpler uh, rear sight. You don't really use the sight a whole lot anyway. Uh, and then they, they, they did some cutouts too. This one doesn't have them to reduce some of the weight. Uh, they changed to a, a simpler blowback system. And what else? It, it wouldn't take, now this one will, but in World War II, most of them would not take a drum magazine. They tried to lighten it, took the compensator off, and uh, just made it easy, and put a parkerized finish on it, not a beautiful blue, you know, like often happens with military firearms. But, uh, but this one's kind of a, I guess, a transitional uh, gun, you could say. Let me see if it will shoot. I really hate doing this, but you know, somebody's gotta shoot the things, you know? I hate doing it. I guess I'm going to go ahead and work on that watermelon. I'm tired of him sitting there in my face. Let me get another mag here. I'll drop that one. It's harder to get seated when you uh, don't have the bolt back. All right. Let's see if she's going to work. <laughs> I can need some more holes in it. <laughs> That's cool. The way the light is, I can actually see the bullets flying through the air. I don't know if, if you can or not, but I, I can, and I'm not kidding. Let's try that one again. All right. Twist my arm. Yeah, twist my arm. All right. You know what? I don't know if the cowboy has been machine gunned before, but let's machine gun him. Yeah, like I said, this one uh, acts a little, little finicky at times. We think we figured out. Yeah, that usually fixes it. <laughs> All right. A little awkward, like I said. And of course, when you combine that with my just natural un lack of coordination, all right. <laughs> so you can see the effectiveness. I wasn't really using the sights, but you can get a lot of 230 grain bullets on a uh, you know reasonably sized target uh, without it just jumping out of your hands. All right. I would not want to be in the way of one of these. I'll tell you that. Uh, even if someone was uh, kind of a novice at shooting. Because like I said, if you can lift it, it's, it's not that hard to control. All right. Let's go for the tomb. No, let's go for the other cowboy. <laughs> Looking right over. Looking right over. I, again, I don't know from your angle, you can see that, but and I've observed that over the years, 
you can actually see the bullets going through the air at certain times of the evening when the light's just right and I'm actually it's really neat it's almost like firing tracers I'm gonna shoot at the tombstone and uh, maybe you'll be able to see that <laughs> oh man too much fun way more than uh, I deserve uh, Thompson submachine gun there's lots of copies I guess there's airsoft versions of it there's the semi-automatic you know version of it and in case you don't believe me it fires the same bullet as this does That's what's kind of cool. The same round that the uh, the pistol chamber that the, the GIs carried, you know, in World War One, World War Two, uh, and then afterwards. So that was the beauty of it. You got the same exact cartridge, 45 ACP, 230 grain round nose, you know, the classic, classic round. So the gun of prohibition, you know, this is uh, is what what we think of lots of times. I don't know. I think when you see this one, like I said. Uh, this configuration, this look, what it takes me back to are the 20, the Roaring 20s, you know, the vertical pistol grip, you know, that, that rifle, that's, that's a Roaring 20s, that's John Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, all those, those characters, Machine Gun, you know, Kelly, that's, that's what they carried, uh, you know, shooting up barrels of whiskey, you know, maybe uh, Elliot Ness, whoever, uh, that's it, and, uh, a really really nice rifle and then as I outlined there as you move into the late 30s and early 40s you had the modifications of it and uh, changed it somewhat so pretty cool pretty cool what are the lies that I not tell you about I shot all those magazines wait a minute I feel something heavy in my mag pouch sorry we're not signing off yet we have a magazine <laughs> that needs emptying now I could put the gun down and just uh, thumb out all the rounds from that magazine, but you know I'm not going to do that, don't you? You know that skillet I didn't really shoot much, did I? Let's work on him a little bit. Just put a couple on him. Yeah. I'm going to go over there and shoot the propane tank, actually. He can really hold it on. Let me try that ram. <laughs> I was just playing there. So there it is. There's your mag release right there. I mean, the mag's not all that hard to get in. It's got that groove you got to slide it up into. Okay. And uh, you notice I wouldn't put it on safe and off safe and all that kind of thing. They, this, these just work better if you don't mess with that. You just leave it on fire and full auto and just go with it and uh, just keep it pointed down range uh, so pretty cool pretty cool famous gun from the roaring 20s the days of prohibition uh, depression era and then also a very famous firearm uh, let me get the other prop also a very famous and useful firearm the days of world war ii uh, looked a little bit more like this okay some of them actually did and were but then you, you, the ones you see a lot of have the side mounted, uh, the side bolt and everything, and probably don't have the fins. Okay, you can imagine that would take more time to produce as well, or the compensator. Okay, and then the cheap rear sight, which is fine. It's really all you need. But uh, they were heavy. Uh, some of the complaints were from GIs that you know, this was replaced uh, by the grease gun. You know, kind of a light, cheap, you know, affair. Uh, mainly because of that it was quick to make cheaper to make a lot cheaper to make and faster but some of the complaints these are not all positive there's not everything is not gravy about the uh the thompson i like them but they are heavy they're really heavy for a pistol caliber carbine fully automatic sub machine gun or whatever and uh they're tough to carry we've carried it across the compound here a couple three times today for various things and the time I got back and had a pocket full of uh, magazines, I mean, I felt like a, a pack mule. It, it is heavy. It really is. And, uh, and then you still have a pistol caliber uh, round. So while it's great at close ranges, moderate ranges, it's still not a 30-06. And, uh, you know, so it, 
you know, there are some disadvantages, but it's a pretty cool uh, piece of hardware. And uh, we're, we're really glad to bring it to you today, I'll tell you. And uh, I didn't really want to shoot it, uh, you know, that's, but you know, John forced me to do it. What can I say? Life is good. <laughs> oh, well, since I'm still here, let me take this moment to thank uh, SDI, the Sonoran Desert Institute, for their support of the channel. Uh, we appreciate you know, their help. Uh, SDI is a place where you can get certified in uh, gunsmithing. You can even get an associate's degree in firearms technology and work in various areas of the firearms field. Might be appealing to you. They work a lot with veterans and uh, it's just a pretty cool place. So check out the link, uh, sdi.edu. Uh, the link is in uh, the description of most videos, almost all videos for the last six months or more. So, uh, so check that out. Also, while I have you, since I'm still here, uh, be sure to, to check the links in all the descriptions because you know we're on Full 30 now also with all the videos. So there's a link in the, in the descriptions to Full 30, as well as, of course, our sponsors, uh, SDI, BudsGunShop.com, uh, Federal Premium. So all the good information is there, as well as uh, keep in mind that on uh, Hickok 45 and Sun, we have uh, quite a few videos over there. John's doing the, the Gun Culture Radio Show over there. Check it out if you haven't done that yet. Our Facebook page, uh, the Hickok 45 Facebook, uh, Hickok 45 and Son Facebook page. That's where we try to stay in touch with you and uh, give you a little extra information. Even post pictures and uh, a little video occasionally, just, just whatever. Uh, mainly just a way to keep up with you all and provide some more information. You know, we're not really Facebookers, but it's a, it's a pretty good system for that, even though most of us are not in love with Facebook, right? <laughs> so check all that out. And you really had better check it out because I might just have to come to your house and have a chat with you if you don't. And I expect to have coffee and donuts ready when I get there. Why?